Shanika is calling me for real. <laughs> okay, I quit. I, I I can't. And now my and then my recording's going off. Shanika. Oh god. I just I emailed checked her. In. She says she checked email and nothing. Tell her to check her spam. Yeah, check her spam. Okay, oh, here okay. she is. Here she okay, wait, is. is she in oh, there? Oh. Do we find her? In our car. She's driving. Come on! No one ever <laughs> listens to me. Oh. <laughs> 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 Oh my can oh that my be God. like the intro of that part like that needs to be cut and like the intro of every single podcast yeah it needs to be that <laughs> you're listening to off color a podcast where we keep it real around pretty uncomfortable topics race identity politics all that I'm your host, Rebecca Henderson, a.k.a. The Tan Tigress, and I have my lovely producer, Janice Matsko. Recording a podcast during a pandemic is so challenging, and it doesn't seem like it would be, but it really is, because I like to have conversations with lots of different people from all over, and I, and, and you know what? People have uneven recording situations. People are calling in the car. People are doing all kinds of wild stuff, deleting the audio, not sending it to us, all that. So we're working on it. And we really appreciate everyone who's been hanging tough with us and all the Patreons. All right. Welcome to Off Color. On this episode, we are taking a look and a reflective time on what unity in community really means. My goal is for if someone is listening to this, they are accessing a conversation that they may not have heard in quote unquote mixed company. So that's sort of part of my goal. Um, My name is Rebecca. For people who are new who do not know me in the studio today, I'm mixed race. I'm half black and half white. I identify as black. Uh, But I'm well aware that I'm a light bright, but in the summer, I'm a little different color. Okay, let's hit it. Okay, so thank you so much for coming. So I want to let, I'm just going to go around. Everyone's going to kind of introduce themselves. And um, because this podcast is about race and identity, please do identify yourself um, or how you identify. And let's start chopping it up. You go first, Shanika. Go ahead and introduce yourself. So um, I am Shanika Carter, who's all on. Oh, my goodness. I see so many beautiful faces um, who I need to call because I need you tomorrow. So I'm glad you're on this on on this podcast for recording. But um, as you all know, I do um, a a number of things. Um, I am an accountant by profession turned uh, philanthropist, community organizer, event organizer, and um, and more recently, I have accepted my calling of actionist, and so um, that is who I am. But look, this is Denver. We got we got work to do. We got work to do. So, um, but yeah, we have twenty activists, uh, twenty actionists that are coming tomorrow to stand in solidarity with our community. So I'm asking everyone to show up and extend the same courtesy that was extended to to us. And then we're going to march on over to the Mile High Steps at the Colorado State Capitol. So um, again, that's who I am. And um, Okay, so Shanika has her march. Now listen, by the time this airs, this will be have passed. So just so you know, we're assuming many people turned out. And by the time you guys hear this, uh, the officers who killed Breonna Taylor will be arrested. That's my hope. All right. Um, yeah. And there will be charges pressed by the time you're hearing this. Um, so Thank that's you. what we wanted to check in with you about, Shanika. Now, you mentioned that you're an, an actionist. OK. And so that is one of the main reasons you're on this it, on this call is because you are someone who's very active in the community. And. We are here to have one of those very uncomfortable conversations about black and brown unity. So I'd also like to introduce my next guest, uh, Lorena Garcia. Could you speak? Yes. Hi, everyone. I'm really excited to be here. My name is Lorena Garcia, and I am a Latina, Mexican-American, Chicana, and um, I do stuff, and I fight for things, and um, I don't stop. 
Sometimes once, once in my life, I decide to run for office. We'll see if that, we'll see if that happens again. But oh, it's happening I did that again. once before. <laughs> I'm like, that's happening. Raina's being a little bit modest because whatevs. I don't know why, but she ran an incredible campaign for U.S. Senate here in the great state of Colorado. And uh, she was robbed of her uh, spot on the ballot. That's a whole other conversation. But I'm just saying it on the record because that is what happened. Them's the facts. All right. Now, we next up, I would like to introduce... Uh, Tez, I feel like I don't know how to pronounce your name, girl, and I feel embarrassed about that, but let's go. All right. My name is Cisco Lidias. Um, I am uh, here in Denver. I identify as a indigenous Afro-Latina um, queer woman. Um, I also am a community organizer known by some in the community as an environmental activist. Um, but always trying to show up for indigenous causes, black and brown causes, and whenever Mother Nature needs us, which is always. So um, that's what I'm about. And just for your future reference, how to pronounce my name. This is how I break it down for for white people and non-Spanish speakers or I speak Spanish, not, but not, this is like know, so but indigenous. Is like, it's got the Z, yeah, yeah, you know. Yeah. It's like like kept, like in in Guatemala. It's like Quetzal. I, I looked at the signs and I was like, I'll just call it Shayla, like everybody else, because <laughs> I cannot. What is that? What is that? <laughs> All right. So here's what I, it's like. T like T E H. Mm. The name Scott. Scott. Mm. And Scott. then Lee. So T Scott Lee. T Scott Lee. There you go. Tess Scotley, listen. <laughs> Do you know, Tez, I have a tattoo of Tess Scotley Poca on my leg. Shut up. I didn't know uh-huh. that. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, were you too afraid to tell me in the beginning? No, I just, <laughs> I'm <laughs> like, <laughs> what is that been weird? Like, I have you tattooed on my leg. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, that is gold. Whew, thank you for that lovely introduction um, to Scotley. And was that good? Was that okay? Yeah, that was good. Okay, good. Okay, good. Uh, Elizabeth, welcome. Why don't you go ahead and just give us a quick intro uh, and tell us what your uh, ethnic background is, if you are so inclined, because this is a podcast about race. Absolutely. I a I identify as a first generation African American. My father came over from Ghana uh, to go to school, where he met my and he met my mother here in the states. Um. I am a mom, I'm an activist, I'm a gym goer, I'm a vet, I am a former surrogate, sister, wife, daughter, I'm all of the things. Um, I'm very big on trying to help educate about the differences instead of arguing and bickering back and forth with people or being nasty towards one another. If I don't like your views, me attacking you is not going to change either of our perspectives. So if I can have an intelligent conversation with you, that's how we get places. So I've done marches. My siblings in Chicago and Indianapolis have both done marches as well. I've done two marches here in um, Colorado, in Oklahoma. And my husband has also done his own individual march. He is a Caucasian male. (laughs) We have two little mixed babies and... I'm genuinely just fighting to make the world a better place for not only my babies, but their babies and everybody's babies. Everybody is somebody's baby. So just working to make the world a better and more equal place for everybody and their babies. Thank you. I love that. So you got some little, you got some little tan tigers running around there. Is what I got trying to some me? little high yellow babies running yeah, around yeah, here yeah, with yeah, the yeah. crazy hair and like the perfect mm-hmm. complexion. Mm-hmm. Just mm-hmm. yep, the perfect complexion for themselves because every yes, complexion is, is beautiful perfect. in its own yes. way. All right, ladies and gentlemen. Okay, Brianna, Bree, welcome to Off Color. You got called in at the last minute, but go ahead, girl, just hit it. Tell yes. us who you are, what you're about. Yes. All that. Um, so my name is Bree. Um, I'm 27 years old. I am half black, half Mexican, and um, I actually just moved from Colorado to Houston in February. So just, you know, a new venture, new things. I'm 
uh, just trying to learn more about myself. I currently work for a nonprofit um, called American Indian Science and Engineering Society. Um, and we basically have programs um, and we give out scholarships to Native American students, Native uh, Hawaiians, Canadians, um, and just support those students who are interested in STEM fields. Um, and of course, I'm little cuz to Lorena. Yay! So, yes. Because <laughs> <laughs> Miss Janika over here was late. And so she was our, our guest, but she was on one of our favorite uh, local Denver shows, the Brother Jeff show, that's called 30 Minutes with Brother Jeff. But everyone that knows if you go on 30 Minutes with Brother Jeff, it's like three hours with Brother Jeff. And so then we got, then we were like, okay, we want to talk about this. And then, then, then we were like, wait, we need to get some black people on here. And every single like black person that we know, including like people like in our families, everyone, everyone was on like a different podcast. Like they were just not available and it was very funny and a little bit embarrassing as well. So now that we're here, we're going to just start kind of chopping it up a little bit. And then there's two things I really wanted to get to. Okay. So just to be very clear. And one that is very important to me is, um, LGBTQ in the activist community and what that how to minimize harm when we're working in what I, and I can, I feel like sometimes, you know, black people will get this like reputation of, oh, we are homophobic because of like the black church or, you know, that. And then I feel like that also comes from Latino heritage also, because it's kind of like, oh, we're Catholics. And, you know, so I just feel like there's a lot there and I want to make sure that that's not my like area. That's not my wheelhouse or whatever. That's why I got Janice of European descent over here. My, my queer, a queer producer <laughs> to keep me to make sure I don't say anything too stupid and then edit it out later maybe. But so I wanted to talk about like the minimization of harm with that and then minimizing the harm between black and brown organizers um in community because I do feel like that is a common theme that we've like had all this harm and we really need to be like working together. And I'll even throw in all the the poor white working class people too. You know what I mean? Just because I feel like that is that is what how we're being divided right now, in my opinion. I have a question also. Yes. <clears throat> um, I think when you're talking about that, I, I'm immediately jumping to the idea that areas where it's appropriate for allies and accomplices to have like key roles in the movement and areas where it's not. You know, so for example, I'm thinking within the within the queer movement. We got tons of like straight people like in lead positions of organizations and like leading the work. Um, and then, you know, but when I, and then I'm thinking also, Brie, your position at your organization, you know, to some extent with your Mexican background, there's parts of your indigen indigeneity, you know, in that, but you're also not a Native American, but you're in that position, right? And so like at what point, and why do we say that in some cases it's okay to have allies? And I don't mean allies as in they have to be like white people. I mean, allies and just not that group. And in some cases we don't like, for example, with like when we're fighting for um, like Black Lives Matter, you know, if there's somebody who's not black that says, hey, what if we do this? It's like there's this pushback away from it, which I agree because I'm like, you're not black. What are you doing? Shut up and sit down. And then also, if it's like for Abolish Ice, when I see a whole bunch of white people trying to lead Abolish Ice stuff, I'm just like, what the hell are you doing? You're not like related to any of this. So like, shut up and sit down. So my question then is, why do we accept that in some movements and understand that there's places where it's not appropriate in other movements? I mean, I think that's the golden question, um, because I don't think that there is going to be like a cut and dry answer. But my my first thought is like closeness to like the proximity of the problem, right? Like how close are you to the situation if you have, um, cause there's a lot of white people that have experienced immigration. Um, so there's some semblance of understanding there in some spaces, but they need to acknowledge their, their, um, approach because when you try to, lead and take the microphone in situations like that that's coming from a place of privilege and a place of entitlement and so there's like a fine balance of bringing your expertise and some of your own personal um ex and lived experiences um whether it's through 
seeing your families go through this or having experienced immigration the right way um, and not thinking it's the right way, like wanting to stand up for those living undocumented undocumented statuses. Like I just think that 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 can make the difference and uh, why we see a lot of, I think, straight folks coming out as allies, the LGBTQ community is because how we're everywhere. We're related to somebody. You've got somebody who's gay in your family, queer of some sort. And so there's this like uprising of people saying, well, this is close to home now and I'm down to get with it. And I think that that's where some of the allyship comes with from, but whether they should be steer steering it or spearheading it, like that's where it becomes problematic. And um, yeah, but I don't know that there's an exact right answer to your question, Lorena, which is like, why is it okay in some spaces and other places not? I think Tez is right on that. And I feel like it's also the area that you're in as far as you're not only your privilege, but the area that you live in and the groups that you are either wanting to be a part of, or you may want to like be in a leadership role of, I think there are different locations and different areas where people are more willing to have that conversation. Well, okay, you're not black, but how are you wanting to contribute? Or you've done little things and you've been at marches and you've been here and there. And some people may even have been brought into the ranks. Like I know myself, I'm not LGBTQ or anything, but my daughter is. It's something that I've grown up around in high school and everything, but it hits a lot closer home, like Tess said, when it's someone who you look at every day or you talk to every day or you interact with every day. You want to help that person and hopefully you go about it in the right way and you don't try to, to, to take the mic or you don't try to stomp and muscle and elbow your way into what's going on. You kind of quietly and gracefully kind of slide in and learn about it. And hopefully you may be in a leadership role, but I don't think that there is a, like I said, I don't think there's a cut and dry right and wrong or why as far as when allies can and do step up or if they don't. I I just wanted to jump in. I didn't hear your question. So you just said, um, you know, um, who, who, you know, introduced myself, but I just wanted to rewind back and, because I've never been asked the question of how do I identify and sometimes in my body and as someone said like about like having that per that perfect complexion and what that looks like and growing up um in this country as a descendant of American slavery and not knowing how to identify because I have over you know, 45 different ethnicities and, you know, my parents are this and my grandparents are this and my great grandparents is, is, is African indigenous and, and, and of a Cherokee nation. And, and then, you know, but not identifying as that and, and still seeing, um, as not human. So for me, it is, it is very emotional when, but, but I've never been asked that. They, they just always have assumed I am what they see. And, and I am the descendant of American slavery, period. I just wanted to rewind. I mean, it was amazing to hear that coming from this group of, of powerful women, like to Lorena's point, um, how, how do we do it all? Um, I can't. We can't do it all. We can't be out and, and sit on 45 different boards because they, it lacks representation. And so we do, we, we have to, especially in Colorado, we have to rely heavily on those, um, that are impacted. And so I, I personally, um, <clears throat> sitting on the board now of like the African American Initiative of Colorado, uh, Democrats, I don't, I, you know, and, and again, I may not necessarily be an African immigrant here. However, um, we we are reaching out to community to bridge the gap of black and African immigrant and um, first and second generation. But again, we still rely heavily on allies to show up. And I and, and not to ask, like, answer a question with a question, but sometimes I feel very alone out here. Um, not saying that I am, I'm just saying that I see and I look and, and as I see all these black women, we're showing up for every cause. 
we're showing up because we're impacted so heavily. And then I look to my left, I look to my right, and I don't see that same support. And reciprocate it. I, I don't. And But again, I continue. We show up, we stomp, we show up. And then and someone said, well, Shanika, what does it look like when we're always taking the causes and the trauma of other communities, but no one shows up for ours? And, uh, and I don't have an answer to that. You said that you feel like sometimes not supported in activism. This is something I hear often, though, that Black women, we show up, we do it, we're saving the world, you know, and I also hear that frequently. This is, you know, that, yeah, where, but where, where are the, where are the Mexicans when, when we need them? Where, where are the gay people when we need them? But they, we show up for them, but they don't show up for us. And I feel like I hear that a lot. And I don't, from what I'm seeing often, I'm not sure that that's, true i'm on i'm on this i've i've been to the front lines like i've been to ground zero in louisville kentucky which is predominantly a black community um but it is an only black community though um and there's no one there i had to call out um you know some some people of faith like the faith community you know i don't know who took activism out of the church but, but uh last i heard your parishioners are human too you know, show up, show up for our people, show up for, they're your people too. And so, um, but that, that's, again, not saying that that is the case, but it often feels, man, it, it feels lonely. It, it definitely feels lonely out here. Um, I was just going to get in on that because this is one of the sentiments that I've been hearing a lot on the Latino side. Um, every, almost verbatim what you just said, Shanika, I've been hearing from, um, from Latino community for a long time, even from my elders, about Black folks not showing up for for Latinos. And I think that that's, there's a little bit of um, truth on both sides and a little bit of a disconnect on both sides because it's been, um, there's different days and different reasons why people show up or don't show up. And like what I want to acknowledge is that there is a risk for either group of these people to show up for one another when we have these rallies and protests and demonstrations. Black folks showing up for Latinos means putting themselves in harm's way and having interactions with police that they may not need to have. And undocumented folks or Latinos going and and running the risk of their immigration status when showing up for Black people. I mean, there are a lot of reasons that hold people back sometimes. You got to do it like if I'm not going to say if it's safe because there's a lot of people that disregard those those hazards and those those things to just show up and show out. Um, but I think it that this is a living sentiment on both sides, and I don't think either one is wrong or either one is like. Well, yeah, I'm going to interject that. just quickly and say that that would be true, right? If there was proper representation there, and when when black folk make up 13 percent of the entire population as, as far as those who identify. And then we're put up against groups who are who are represented two to three times more, right? Let's look at Colorado, for example. We're only 3.6% of the entire population in the state. So to say, if you see three black folks at the event, that's that's the we're represented 3%. That's us. That's it. Because we do bear and we do come out and we do show up um, in those numbers. Um, however, um, I, I had to come in like Lorena Garcia, like I had a stand in solidarity event and she, and she called that out. And I mean, I just, I couldn't like cry. Right. But I was crying and I had to turn away because she felt it. And she's like, where are my people? You know, why aren't you here? This affects you too. But not, again, I'm not saying that there isn't uh, support there. Right. Cause there is, but I think to compare the support is, 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 in my opinion, not to take away, to, but in my opinion, is um, is a little unfair. Yeah, and I think it's also generational too, right? Like I think uh, right now, because I'm constantly, constantly clapping back at Latinos all the time that say that Black people don't show up. Like I clap back at it all the time. When I was at Standing Rock, it was BLM that was there um, preparing for civil disobedience alongside Indigenous people. Like they were there 
in those first few months before it escalated and became like a Coachella kind of thing. Like (laughs) what I think is happening or like what I've seen in just my personal, I can only speak from what I've seen, um, has been that in conversations with elder Latinos in the community in the past, it's like they black folks don't show up for us then. So that's why we don't show up now. And it's just like, like perpetual grudge holding or something that is like something I think a younger generation is trying to combat and trying to figure out and have conversations about vulnerable conversations because um, that doesn't work. It doesn't work on either side. Like we're more powerful together. We period. are. And we're oppressed in, in the same ways with different impacts. And so the sooner we can acknowledge that, the sooner we can fight against a common oppressor. Absolutely. So saying, saying that I'm looking at Brie over here, our, our, our Blacksican in the hizzy. And I, and I want to know, I, I guess I'm wondering, like, how is that for you as like, it's cause for me as like somebody who I feel like I was like, Oh, half my family was riding on top on the running the ship and half my family was cargo beneath the ship. Right. Like that's all in my bloodline. And so, and I feel that very strongly. And so I'm wondering for you, like hearing this, like divide and it's like, it's, it's your own personal divide in your body kind of, uh, mm-hmm. maybe that was a little too much, but anyway, go ahead. Bri. Um, it's interesting because I feel like growing up, I guess I didn't really like, there wasn't that divide. Um, I feel like in my family, we, we've, we've made it, you know, it is what it is. Like we didn't really have these like where I felt like I had to choose or I felt like, you know, I couldn't be who I am just in, in, in everything that I am. Um, so it's, it's hard for me. Um, I guess I'm more of a person that if I feel like something is not being, not being done, or if I feel like something needs to be said, I'm going to say it to you. I'm not going to take it to the streets, I guess. And, and maybe that's, that's different from, you know, a lot of you guys that are on the call, but it, you know, if, if my friends or if my colleagues that I know are saying something or feel a certain way about black people or Mexican people, like, I'm just going to tell you straight up, like, this is how I see it. And if, you know, again, like, if this is something that you don't agree with, then we need to have a conversation about it. Um, I don't know. I, I, Again, it's just hard for me because I really feel like my my upbringing wasn't I didn't feel divided. I didn't feel like I had to choose. I didn't feel like there was um, just a difference in in who I am. So do you feel like that's still true or that culture, the culture around you feels that way in in when you step into those activist roles that you don't have to choose? Um, I mean, I guess so. Um I feel obviously because I, I look black. And so I think a lot of, a lot of that comes from me really on, on one side is standing up for my Hispanic and my Latino people, because it doesn't, it doesn't seem that I look like that. It doesn't seem like I, I present that. And so, yes, in a way, like, I guess more on the Latino side, the, the Mexican side of me, like, yeah, I'm more willing to to say things, I guess not more willing, but just, just more vocal about it. I don't know if that really even answered the question, but. (laughs) No, because uh, you can never answer. Listen, our identities actually, especially I would say for mixed race people, you know what I mean? Like there's like a bill of rights for mixed race people. Like we got, we have our, we have the right to identify how we want to identify and for your identity to change depending on like different situations. And I think that I appreciate that thoughtful response Brie um and I think though what it also comes down to and this is something I'm always saying is that it comes down to anti-blackness like that is where I always end up I'm like taking it black like every time because I feel like that is to me that's where the root of the of the divide really is in our communities and when we're organizing is it's like that's what I I think but so I um I work my day job is working with predominantly Spanish speaking families. And there, I was asked to come on and talk about what in the world is black lives matter. Um, and so I jumped, I, I had them all together and we were all on a zoom call and we did a full talk on 
Um, this is what Black Lives Matter means, and this is why you need to care. And this is why you need to get on board. And one of the one of the really awesome things that happened after that call was I was noticing all over on Facebook, a whole bunch of them started adding, like, they started adding the frames to their profile pictures. You know, they started posting things about, um, like, whether they it was an article that they read or whether they said, um, whether they're like, I'm actually going to go to a protest. You know, like, they started actually doing things. A lot of the reasons why we why we think actions happen or actions don't happen is really stemmed with a lack of knowledge. Like they just didn't know what it was. They didn't understand how it was connected. They didn't they didn't see the connection. I think in a lot of what what a shift in what we ought to start doing is instead of and this goes with activism and this goes with organizing and this goes like when we're out there, like we shame each other. We shame each other like crazy, like, and that's just, that's not helpful. That's not helpful. And whether it's like on purpose or not, but I think like we really need to get to a place where instead of like, we need to assume, and I know we talk about this a lot, like we need to assume positive intention, you know? And also like per, whether this is a, a really jacked up way of thinking, I'm also going to assume you don't know. I'm first going to assume positive intention. I'm going to assume that you don't know. And then after conversation, if I realize that, you know, and you still don't give a crap, then we're done. Yeah, I just wanted to name too, just just for clarity's sake, that in no way, shape or form did I, I disagree with you, Shanika, about when you look to your left and to your right and the lack of, of community, other communities by your side. I was just wanting to name that it's interesting that there's that similar almost verbatim argument coming from Latino communities. And so where is the disconnect? Why aren't we seeing the same things? Um, going to what you were saying, Lorena, um, that in these times, um, the common oppressor just like has to be at the root of everything that we talk about because what we're getting caught up on a lot in this lack of education in one another's um, struggles is literally by design. Like we have been so separated from one another that we don't know what each other's struggles look like, even though we're getting hit by the same exact forces that be, you know, and we're getting all of these different ways that we're impacted that when we try to explain it, it's like, no, 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 that's not what it looks like. And like put down each other's realities when really it's okay to have different realities and the same systemic problem you know and the the sooner that we can realize that it's okay to not only have completely different perspectives on on the actual pain um that our organizing strategies must be different and unique to our our separate fights for them to be effective because we've got language that we're dealing with we've got cultural differences there is an indigenous way to approach things and that is completely different than the way black organizers may want to approach things and um none of it is right or wrong and that's where we put each other down i think sometimes it's like you're doing it wrong <laughs> that is not how you handle the police that is not how you have a silent protest that is not how you have peaceful protest and it looks different culturally and in these different fights and we need to let that sit and like be okay with the differences uh I completely agree. I think that we've let uh, white America influence behavior to the point where we even question, um, are they doing it right? Uh, but yeah, I think that we've let the narrative on on what, what behavior looks like. Um, and I've always corrected, you know, even our allies, you know, why would you march and why would you protest in the middle of the road? Because your ass been ignoring me for the last 10 years. That's why. And until I blocked you from getting to Costco, then you acknowledged me. So to go back to what you said, we have to look at the data and um and the and, and, and acknowledge that there was like black exodus from the state of Colorado after the federal employment job left Colorado. And I think uh, and I only found this out yesterday because I'm still trying to understand like, you know, in outreach and doing outreach, how to expand the electorate and get us more engaged and get people to actually even care. So 
if we're fighting each other on what activism looks like, and then the activist like, I'm just trying to get my people to show up and to care about those things that are affecting them. Hey, before you before you go, tell us where you're going and and say goodbye to us, girl. Because I know people got to go, but I want to make sure that we we know where you're going and what you're doing. We got to keep up. We got to keep it safe. Keep All right. So, um, I I I started and 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 this was by community because it was requested. And like I said, I I didn't set out to become an actionist. I am an accountant. Okay, <laughs> and 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 it hit me. It fell into me. It was my calling. And um, so we have created an organization called Caravan for Racial Justice. Caravan for Racial Justice was designed to show up for communities that are voiceless. Uh, we bring media, we bring bodies, and we stand in solidarity with hurting communities. Um, so if you are interested, please check us out on the web, info at uh, uh, Caravan for Racial Justice is Twitter. And info at uh, uh, C4 Racial Justice is online. Uh, my kids are just, you know, I'm also a mom. So I left Brother Jeff <laughs> and then picked up my three children. My husband works nights. He's a postal worker. So, you know, we're, we're dealing with that. And, um, but I, I just, I'm, I'm just, like I said, I'm honored to hear the different perspectives. Uh, keep showing up. That's it. Keep showing up. But yeah. I'm gonna then, always show and, up. And I know, and I got I got a little bit of chills, honestly, when you were saying, um, thinking about Lorena standing up there and saying, like, "Where are you?" And like that is that is also what I'm looking for in our communities is having people just just to be there sometimes. And that was our 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 original uh, co-host, R.I.P. Dr. Gregory Diggs. That was a big message of his was you don't have to say something every time you go somewhere and you can show up for other people's stuff just show up and that's it you don't have to take it over you don't have to do anything just be there for them and they'll tell you what to do right could you yeah, answer that goes, Lorena? like I, what was that experience for you because we never got a chance to talk after that right <laughs> so what was that when you say yes to standing in solidarity with black community what how was that for you and then i'm gonna go i, I just wanted to know that um how was it? There is. So when I speak to that, when I talk about like, where the hell are you? Like show up. I'm very also like aware and acknowledging that there's different ways of showing up. And I think one of the things is like, I'm looking around and I'm seeing one in commerce city. Okay. In commerce city. And if we're talking about representation, the majority of the people at that rally should have been Latinos and they weren't. They weren't, there was like, what? And when I asked how many were there, there was like three, four people raised their hands. And I was like, this is embarrassing. And, um, and I think the reason why I said this, cause I also know, like, I know like 15 people that I reached out to that I was like, this is right next door to you. Get your butt over here. Right. So one, it was like this idea of like, I'm frustrated. And yet I'm saying this and I'm preaching to the choir here because you guys are here. And even if you were listening on Facebook, you're still showing up because you're still listening on Facebook. You know, so I think one of the things, one of the things that I'm, um, I didn't feel, I didn't feel embarrassed or ashamed of like saying it because like you speak truth. And if you're speaking the truth, then you should like, you know, like you speak your truth. I think one of the things that I want to better understand, I think that's one of the, also the reasons why I'm super thrilled that Brie is here is because if we do have people that are super knowledgeable, that care about the issues and yet going to, a rally isn't their thing, right? How do we still engage? Like, you know, where is it? And like, what, what are we missing? Because I know Brie, like I see you, I see you on Facebook. Like, I know that you're not silent. And so what do we do and how do we engage folks that aren't on our, like on our speed dial of texting, like show up right now at two o'clock. And then how do we do that in an, in a meaningful way where we're not necessarily like saying, well, if you're not like, if you're not coming to my banner flying at 7 a.m., then you're not down with the movement. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? So like, that's the other thing is, is I'm saying this. And, and I also kind of, I'm, I felt like even if I'm, I said Latinos aren't showing up, I still felt like the people who needed to hear it weren't hearing it. 
I think something that could be really healing for creating those bridges too, um, the bridges that are already done been, built, been there, bridges that have already been there because people in the past worked really hard to build those bridges for black and brown communities to unite and they need maintenance. You know, that's the way I look at it. They need hella maintenance. And so if we can get into a habit of putting the call out to call in rather than calling out to just call out like where the hell are you at versus like we invite you to be here. And when you put out that invitation and they don't come, then it's like, I'm definitely mad, mad. I'm big mad. Um, but like we're in a culture right now that I think is very call out and not call in. And that's where a lot of the labor of love comes in is like having to have the patience, which none of us have the time and it takes a lot to build the patience, but to actually say, you know, it would really mean a lot to me for you to show up and that be a one-on-one -on -one conversation with somebody. Um, and whether it's for the black side or the brown side, for the indigenous side, for the Asian side, like, right. Like, do we all show up for Asian causes? I don't know. I haven't. So it's like, um, those invitations are, are really important to extend from a place of love. And I think sometimes when we're calling out, they, it comes off so like out of angst and frustration that that's all the invitee is getting. And like, you're saying it, you're naming it because you want them there. You want them there because you value their, their, um, solidarity, you val value their allyship. But the way that it comes off is like a call out and that doesn't feel warm and fuzzy. And Taz, I don't think it's so much like the hippy dippy love. Growing up, my mother always told me you get more flies with honey than you do with vinegar. If you want people to come out and to come out and help or come out and support or even like little stuff like posting on their Instagram and things like that, they put a little honey on it. A nice, hey, we're doing this. I... I want you to come with me to come be a part of it. I want you to come be, come and see this or stroke their ego. I, I, I feel like we need you to be a part of this, but it, it, like you said, with the culture, it's very much, where have you been? You're not doing enough or you're doing it wrong. When in a lot of cases, it's not necessarily that it's wrong. It's just different. There's a difference between a wrong way to do something or experience something and just a different way of doing things and experiencing things. I really think it made a huge difference, at least in small numbers, um, when a group of Latinos decided to translate whole Instagram and social media campaign to educate on what Black Lives Matter means in Spanish. And those things matter because that's like a warm invitation. Like we want you to understand our struggle and we'll go the step of like making sure that it's even written in your language for you to understand. And like that. I think went a long way. Um, it was a, a lot of the youth that I know were using those tools that were created for them to have dialogue with their families who just don't get BLM. Like, right. They, all they see is the news. All they see is even shorter versions of it on Telemundo. And it's like, they don't really understand the concept or what's being fought for. And so when those resources become available, it's just, night and day for for making the communication clear so something that you said Tez, as we are as we're wrapping up here is um i love that the that the bridges have been built but they need maintenance i think some i know that you're not here in the official capacity for your for the brown black and brown unity community jam that you've been sort of organizing um uh to bring people together for that those kinds of healing talks and i I really see the value in spending our time, spending time just together, really, and spending time like in community beyond when we have to go for a march, beyond when we have to show up at court or or whatever we're we're trying to do or testifying at the Capitol, right? Like, what about these like moments, like you know, like like this? Really, mm -hmm. is what I'm I'm talking about, especially now in the in the pandemic. It's like I feel like we have we have some time to to talk to each other and and to listen to each other like for real right and and i 
I want to see more of that. That's why I really, um, I was really excited about, about that group because I feel like we're, we're, we're traumatized and we need each other and we need that support and we need that love. And I, I am the last person, like I will go off. I'm like, Oh, Van Jones talking about his love shit. Ugh. Like I will just go crazy. Cause I'm like, yeah, no, but more and more, um, as we go through this time period, I am kind of starting to feel like maybe we just need to love each other. Like for real, like maybe that really is the answer. Maybe is it love? I think it's compassion. I think it's like, yeah, it's mm. not love. It's compassion. It is about, mm. about, um, you don't have to be an empath to just be like, okay, that looks like it hurts. <laughs> that looks like it sucks. Um, and that may not look like my pain, but it, pain is pain. And letting that pain be seen is like validation for one another. And the sooner we start validating one another's traumas, pains, and, and struggles, like, Cause that's what's happening right now. We're like invalidating one another and that's where the bridges are getting their damage along the way over time. And, um, it's generational work. Uh, we can get it all figured out this just generation. And if we don't actually teach our kids to maintain it over the years, it'll fall apart in one. And so, yeah. I think a lot of it also comes down to like recognizing our humanity, right? Recognizing the humanity in other people recognizing it in ourselves that we're all part of the same human experience and um but yeah we all have the capacity to see each other as human you need to recognize i recognize the rebecca in you <laughs> do you recognize the rebecca in me <laughs> 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 well, it's 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 so true and I I oh I'm like it's so simple it feels so simple to me like that is what I think I keep getting stuck on now and I I and if you see me on social media you know I'd be going crazy sometimes but like that is it seems really simple to me I'm like why can't we just work together for mutual liberation to dismantle systems of oppression like why can't we just do it what's the yeah. big deal guys you have to keep in mind simple doesn't mean easy it's like okay i see what i need to do right here like it's in my sights i can do this and you're like but it should just be a straight line like it su seems super simple but you're like wait and i gotta go and then i have simple isn't easy and progress isn't linear mm. to try mm. and get the work done like um with any situation like i'm gonna put the work in and i'm gonna do this this and this and bam it'll be done and i'll be accomplished and you're like but wait i did this why am I three steps back from where I started from? You're like, wait, but I felt fine yesterday, but today, why am I, why can't I get bed? Like, because progress and development is, is not linear. You have to understand you have your ebbs and flows, your highs and lows, but you can't sit in your lows. You can't sit in that hard time. Be like, okay, well, I'm, that's it. I quit. I put my hands up. I'm not going to continue to reach out to anybody. I'm not going to do anything else. Like, that's it. Because then you're never going to accomplish anything. You take that hit, you take that kick in the butt, you dust yourself off, you may pout a little bit, but then you keep going. You go to that next event or you talk to that next person or you make that next post. Mm. Mm, I love that. Okay. So before we close out, I would like everyone, your closing thought from this conversation that's going to be ongoing, will, will, this will, obviously, this is something that, the maintenance, it's the maintenance, right? Is that having these kinds of conversations, addressing it making space for it yes so. i'll go first why not um one i'm thankful i was able to come on this platform with you guys it was super last minute but thank you tess for reaching out i appreciate it um carrying on and going out i want there to be a unity within the black community i want us to hopefully be able to do what was simple but figure it out that we are all in this together and for the Black community to reach out to other Indigenous people, to Latinos, just to reach out. Because we're all in the same storm, but we're all in different boats. So, hey, let me help you bail your boat out. Or, hey, your boat is nicer than my boat. Let me get some pointers. Because when it comes down to it, it is just a human experience. But you have, we have to remember, remember to view everybody as a human. 
And that means everyone should be treated as a human. So going forward, I will take with me to continue to reach out in the Black community, to continue to make comments on random people's Facebook posts, and to encourage them to speak up and to encourage them to help educate those people that follow them and those people that they do have an influence on. Who's next? Come on. I will just say, I will just say that I think that a lot of good can come from looking at commonality commonality in the struggle, commonality in culture, commonality in approaches. Um, we got to look at the differences, but we also got to look at our commonality because we can really build off that the most easily. And one thing that is a trend is that women identifying folks in history are the ones in these groups of colors that get shit done. Like, look at us on this call. Who shows up? Who responds to the text? Who, like, turns out? And uh, it's been said many a times, black women get people elected, right? They really have a hustle and grind like no other. When we talk about all the Chicano movements and uh, immigrants' rights movements, women have been at the back of those fights. And youth. And we all have that in common, too. Our youth um, make huge pendulum swings for generations. And there's something that we can do is elevate women, elevate youth. And I think if we can respect those two groups of people, we'll get a lot further. <laughs> and it's something that these these POC communities have in common. I'll go next. Um, my hope for our world today is just to see each other, to really to really like look into each other's eyes and to understand each other and to have compassion. Um, like it was, like we said earlier, just to, we need maintenance. Um, you know, I'm, I'm 27, but that doesn't mean that I don't, um, want kids someday. And I think that's, that's a, that's a big, huge part of like how I look at things. Um, because I want to be able to bring kids into this world and, you know, have them not, not see the things that I've seen, not see the things that my parents have seen, that my grandparents have seen. Um, so that's definitely something that I, that I hope to do. And I, and I hope to just continue to, um, reach out to those that I can physically touch and like those people that I physically see each and every day, you know, it may not be, you know, doing the most that I can do, but it's what I can do right now. Thank you so much. And the only thing I wanted to add is, girl, don't be rushing into having no children, okay? I have one, and I feel like I want you to think really hard about it. Long and hard. Okay? Because <laughs> it's not, it's, 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 and then you never know if there's going to be a pandemic and you'll be trapped with your child in the house <laughs> for a year and you have to become a, a homeschool teacher and that's why you can't get your podcast together because everything is a mess okay okay anyway. yes duly noted duly hey noted. but hey i do have to say something on that note because it is something that i have gotten hit up for by my family like how how are you going to bring children into this world how are you going to put them on this planet how are you going to um you know, put them in this like political climate. And so what my answer to that is, is that white people aren't going to slow down their procreation, not white people, supremacists, haters, freaking psychopaths. They ain't slowing down their procreation rates because of all of this. So if we're going to keep the, the balances, Balance, yes. right? like we got to keep um, nurturing and raising little warriors in this world. And when you're ready for it, because you can't do it right if you're not ready. Um, in heart. <laughs> Stop lying, girl. Don't be ready. <laughs> ready. In heart. In heart. Only in heart. Because most of us ain't ready. Um, but at the same time, like, I don't ever discourage anybody from having the babies that they want to have because we need to raise the next generation to keep up with. Sorry, mm -hmm. Lorena, you're going to close us out. Do it, girl. That's a lot of pressure. I was trying to get in before Brie, but she was like, I'll go first. So <laughs> um, I think, you know, we're having these conversations. We're in the moment. We're in the movement. And this is essentially what happens every generation. And yet the changes 
that need to happen to get us to a place of equity, to get us to a place of, of greater justice, unfortunately lies in the hands of policymakers. And our policymakers are rarely courageous enough to do what's necessary to make the changes that we need right now. And what they often do is they punt the issue to the next generation. Mm -hmm. We've seen that every generation since the United States became a country. We cannot fail the next generation. We, and I say we, as the millennial generation that's right now, as the Z generation that's right now, and yes, even the freaking boomers that are still breathing right now, right now is when we actually have to make the changes necessary. And you know what? The only way that's going to happen is if we actually vote. Believe me, I know that this election is going to be one of the hardest ones to vote in, but I also don't remember an election where I wasn't plugging my nose and voting, where I wasn't jumping for joy because I was able to fill in a bubble of someone I was really excited about. So we have to vote. And then we have to build coalitions behind people that we know are not just going to punt a difficult decision down to the next generation just because they want to win their next election. These conversations are great and they're amazing. These actions are incredible. And unfortunately, it's the people that have the power that are the ones that are left to make the decisions and make the changes that are necessary for us to achieve what we're fighting for. So we need to change those people. I wanted to add one thing. Um, I Wait, love she that. did a whole speech. What the hell? I know. Here? No, I, <laughs> that was incredible. <laughs> That was incredible. And um, it really like drives home the point of this. Uh, so at the beginning of the pandemic, I started reading this book. It's called Everything is Fucked, um, which is incredibly appropriate for the time uh, I was reading it. And um, in it, he basically talks about how like hope, you know, like having hope and just hoping for a better future is a double edged sword. Right. We can't keep like you were saying, punting the problems down the road and just hoping that eventually they will be solved. And the point that he makes in it is that we have to stop treating each other as means to an end. We need to start treating each other as the end, the desired end and not simply means to an end. Hashtag like put people saying. first. Yeah. Put people first and vote and take action. And then speak going back to what Tez said. Let's vote, but let's organize around getting women in office and not just any woman, right? Because we know not, not every woman is awesome, but like, let's get women in office because women are doers. Women are not going to be the ones that are going to say, no, 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 we'll deal with that later. Now is not the time. Well, some do, but the ones that we're going to rally against are not going to. So we really need to do that too. Mm, you know, I'm on that. That's all. That's one of my things I like to do. But I'm also this is now now we're out in the weeds, y'all, because I feel like I want to have this political conversation about what can we do with the ones that we're kind of like, hmm, you're not the best, but maybe we could puppet you a little bit, you know? So I, I'm 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 thinking about that a lot. It's a future episode. Yeah. Future episode. Future episode. Okay. Bye. Thank you guys so much. You are bye. too precious, Boo Bear. You you're too bye. precious. Mm -hmm. You're like a peanut butter jelly sandwich. A temple of girls. Oh. Okay, <laughs> bye. <laughs>
you oh my god you guys you guys yes i'm gonna put it i'm gonna put you in ready you guys call her we have a house representative <laughs> leslie harrod welcome leslie harrod Oh, Leslie, we you we are live and on the air right now. I'm not kidding. So uh, we're recording. This is kind of incredible. I know you guys didn't know I was balling like that. Oh, I'm a local nut job, but sometimes my elected officials return my calls. All right. Now, real quick. I called you because I felt the energy that you needed to talk to me, so that's why I called you. You did, and I'm like so ready to, to talk to you about... Um, Wait, are you really ready to come on? You want to come on? Sure, let's do it. Oh, snap. Okay, are you home by your computer or no? No, I'm, on my, I'm driving. You're driving. All right. See, <laughs> you, can, you can just talk. Can you hear her through the mic, Janice? Damn. All right, because we want you to click in. Why don't you just come over, sit on the porch. Hold on. <laughs> <laughs> we want because this is important. She's a pol this is what I'm talking about. It's policymakers. We want the policymakers that are going to help us have unity in the community. That is what the conversation is about. Do it. And so that's why. But I can't do it right now if you can't click on my link because you're driving. So no, I can't. But have me on another time. I'm happy to. Okay, we'll have you on as soon as you want to. Well, you're like kind of on it right now, to be perfectly honest. <laughs> <laughs> I got all kinds of local leaders. We're doing a conversation about black and brown unity. Is that a conversation you are interested in from a social justice perspective? Representative Herod. Always. Okay. Always. So, always. All right. So we're going to have you back on to, to further have a deeper conversation about these things. And to also, we're pushing it. You know me. I'm, I know that, you know, I'm a radical. And I and I and I love some of the work that you've been doing, but we know we'll push you as far as we can. Oh, I know you will, and I'm <laughs> counting on it. Yeah, <laughs> accountability. Okay, I love you. I'll talk to you soon. Thank you so much for calling in, Bye. Representative. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. <laughs> when my house representative calls me, I it's usually because I have called her and she's calling me back and I feel like that's great because I'm always like you have to shut down the schools <laughs> we're all gonna die okay sorry start over are we ready